Good evening, everybody. This is a completely new way of giving a talk for all of us. And so I am imagining you in my mind's eye, sitting together, being brave enough to use technology for something you normally would not use technology for. And thank you so much for doing that. Well, tonight I'm going to speak with you about the artist Emil Nolder. And as you see, the title sounds wonderful and exuberant. Emil Nolder, Colour is Life. But now this talk has a new element, which it's never been able to have before until now. Because in 2019, the, the documentation of Emil Nolder's secret life was finally made public in a gallery in Berlin. And with that exhibition came an amazingly scholarly book called Emil Nolder, the artist during the Third Reich. And so my talk, which was normally mostly exuberant and joyful, um, has to include in it the darker element of Nolder's life. And although that is difficult, I think it is very, very important. And I always remember hearing somebody say, um, it is our secrets. We are only as ill as our secrets. So let us look at Nolda and be healthy. So here we are looking at Emil Nolda and his wife Ada. This was in their ripe old age in the beautiful garden of their house on the German Danish border called Siebel. He was born in 1867 and he died in 1956. He was the son of a farmer, the fourth, the fourth child of, the, of his family. And he was brought up speaking um, low Danish and German at school. He did trainings which were craft trainings and only decided to become a painter later. He was actually refused from art schools on more than one occasion. And his marriage to Ada sort of lifted him up socially and helped him financially as well. She herself was an actress, but she came from the middle classes and she loved and adored him and supported him in the most extraordinary way. This painting was called Pentecost and it was painted in 1909. And I have begun my talk with this is the first image because I want to try and trace and understand what made Nolder believe the things that he did and how he manifested those beliefs in his work and in his behaviour as a person. He was deeply committed to painting religious pictures and he took this painting to try and have it um, accepted for an exhibition in Berlin in what was called the secession and the painting was refused. If you look at the work, it is extraordinary if you think of the time it was painted, 1909, that women didn't have the vote, that if you weren't married and you loved a man, you were cast out from society, that there was the most extraordinary bourgeois rules and all kinds of incredible constrictions on a, a person's life. And you look at this painting and you can't believe it was painted at a time where there were probably still, you know, people were still using um, gas lights and horses and carriages. It seems so modern. And the reason it's so modern is because it is so free and some people would call it crude. It's almost mask-like. The faces are almost mask-like. The paint is thick and heavily applied. If you look at the, the expressions on the faces, he's painted the disciples as if they really were um, Jewish and from the land that, that Christ was born in and lived and died. There's no way in which he has made the, the disciples Aryanized. And he's painted this painting out of his deepest, deepest struggle and connection with Christianity. But not being accepted by the secession began for him 
a long, long battle with the establishment of the art world in Germany. And at that time, there was an incredible struggle between what was called um, German Expressionism and also the art that was coming out of Paris, the Impressionists, and many, many German painters were struggling to have Expressionism accepted as the as the culture and the art of Germany. They wanted to um, honour a German way of looking at things. They found the Impressionists terribly superficial and rational and lacking in the realm of magic and imagination. And the whole reason that they wanted to paint in this way was they were describing an inner struggle and an inner world and they were much more interested in something being filled with meaning and feeling than being just correct and and looking like a sort of pale imitation of Renaissance painting. So when Nolde was rejected, there began a long, long struggle against the, the, the accepted art world in Berlin. This dark painting, which is a group of six gentlemen and is called Six Gentlemen, it was painted by Nolde in 1921. And he called it that, but it actually is a kind of painting where he's, he's painting who he sees as his enemies, the critics. And one of the people that is thought to be in this painting, though nobody knows which person it is, is the, the man who was president of the Berlin Secession, who was called Max Lieberman. Max Lieberman was a man of, he had come from a terribly, terribly well-off family and he had used his fortune to collect one of the greatest collections of Impressionist painting and he himself um, painted in the Impressionist style, was renowned as a portrait painter and he and Nolder quarrelled terribly about Nolder's views and ideas and he was actually expelled from the secession. And this painting is a kind of expression of Nolder's feeling of being oppressed and scapegoated by a group of people who held all the power in the art world in this great city. And so I put it here because I really wanted you to experience him sort of struggling with these ideas and in the process of struggling with these ideas of course he's struggling with people and he's struggling with who's going to give him exhibitions, who's going to include him, who's going to take him seriously because Nolder wasn't just worried about um, his paintings being bought, he actually was a painter who uh, who was who was incredibly incredibly successful i mean lots and lots and lots of people bought his paintings but he wasn't just interested in people buying his paintings he was interested in being made the sort of um the man who stood for and led german art and german culture he wanted to be accepted by the establishment as the king, the one who knew and understood and led German art to its true, true destiny as a as a cultural holder of truth for for his country. So he was very, very upset that these establishment figures didn't accept him. And the painting, as you can see, it's not it's not a sort of joyful painting. The characters look they look out at you with with narrowed eyes or staring eyes or frowning faces. The colours are are quite um, the light is a cold light. They they don't look like a group of people where you say, Oh, they look like they they'd be really fun. Let's go and have a, a conversation with them. He's painting people who he sees as his enemies, as the people who've misunderstood him. This painting is called Wildly Dancing Children and strangely enough it is a picture which tells us why Nolder thought that he should be allowed to be the leader of German art. 
It's a picture of little girls um, playing a game where they're, they're dancing and whirling in the most incredible free way. And it, when I first saw this picture, I actually thought it was like a painting by Kokoschka. It's got hundreds of tiny marks all over it. It's almost abstract. I had to sort of really stand back and look with my eyes half closed to see the actual forms. And this picture sort of sums up what Nolder thought about himself. He thought that he was born in the country, close to nature and close to the seasons and close to a kind of simple Christian spirituality. He actually describes lying on the ground with his arms outstretched on his back and experiencing himself as Christ taken down from the cross and how when he le turned over and put his arms onto the earth, the earth was like a sort of beloved female form. And he basically believed that the artist that was most needed in these times of kind of rationalism and the sort of loss of magic needed to have this closeness to nature and this closeness to that which some people may call primitive, but which he felt was innocent and pure and untouched by all the the difficult things about modern civilization. And so he he really told the story of himself as being this boy who'd been brought up on, on a farm in Denmark where the only book in the house was the Bible and where he made his art with no preparatory drawings or building it up with sketches, but rather that he 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 entered the process of painting in a sort of frenzy. He painted the frenzy, the, the frenzy of dancing. And it was this that he wanted to bring to painting, this that he saw as authenticity and realness and purity. In 1913, Nolder went with Ada on an anthropological journey, which was funded by the German government. It included going to New Guinea, Moscow, Siberia, Korea, Japan, China, the South Seas. And while he was there, he made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of paintings and drawings. and he very, very often concentrated on the dance. And this painting is called The Candle Dancers. And if you um, look at the colour, you can see that he is in a completely different country. He isn't in the Northern European world. He's in the wonderful world of the South Seas. And the figures are half naked and their breasts are exposed, they are not children, they're women, their hair is wild, the clouds and the, um, the, the place which is the sky looks like flames, the actual candles the, the women are dancing around are flickering in the same colour as the burning sky, their arms and legs and bodies are are wildly moving and pushing right out to the edge of the painting. And there you have Nolder experiencing in these other cultures the same kind of what he would call purity and closeness to the true unspoiled human being. And one of the things that I find really interesting, I once had to give a talk about masks and there I learnt about Apollo and Dionysius and Apollo is the god of form, music, structure, thinking and Dionysius is this wild god of wine who in a sort of frenzy um, comes to some kind of truth and reality and somebody told me this beautiful thing about how if you want to be powerful as a Dionysian being. It's also quite good to have an Apollonian form 
so that within the bowl, the form, the Apollonian form, you can wildly dance. And at the same time as you wildly dance, you don't just dissipate. And I think this is one of the very, very special things about Nolde, that he has this extraordinary freedom. But because his the structure behind his freedom is so real and strong, it looks very free, but it's actually really very beautifully observed. And there's this combination of, of sort of invisible form in which this Dionysian wildness can um, take place without just being um, dissipated. And he did say that if you have too much form, then you get something sterile and dead. And if you have not enough form, then you have something which is flabby. And this combination of form and freedom is something that was very, very important to him. But it was so important that you had the impression that he had not had to think about the form at all. It just, he believed that he himself just, as an artist, had this special ability to just bring forth the work with the same kind of freedom as those dancers are dancing, free of any kind of reason, but purely out of it, his deeply felt experience. This may seem a very strange picture to put right here in the middle of the dance, but I'm putting it there because I want to explain to you what Nolde thought about visiting all these other cultures. He basically had the most incredible sympathy for all these other civilizations, indigenous civilizations, and he felt that there was so much that we could learn from them because they were still so close to nature and hadn't been destroyed by modern thinking. And while he was in Berlin, he used to go and visit something called the Ethnological Museum, and it was full of all these objects that had been collected from all around the world. And he himself collected many objects. If you go to his house in Zibo, you can see all these objects, and you can see them over and over again occurring in his paintings. And this painting has, has been made out of these objects. It's called The Missionary. And it basically says what he thinks of these cultures and also of how we have treated them. And what he's done is he's taken some objects, a, a, an African sculpture and a Sudanese mask and a Korean figure. And he's placed them into his painting. The Korean figure originally had a white face and he has painted in the picture with a brown face so that he's really making a statement. So what he does is he uses the objects and he paints them in such a way as to give you a narrative of his views. And um, what he's actually saying here is you see this, this woman standing in a position of, um, she's standing before the powerful priest in a submissive position with her holding her jar which he seems to be offering to this godlike white missionary. And he is more frightening because he has hidden his whiteness behind brown paint. And behind him is this mask from Sudan, which seems to be looking askance and in horror at this relationship between the missionary and the beautiful woman. And the missionary is um, constrained has no spontaneity, has a kind of terrifying face, is in a relationship of power, is commanding submission. And the beautiful woman with her, her lovely body and her sweet child tied to her, tied to her with her blue cloth is somehow not appreciated for her abundance and beauty and life, being so full of life. And this is really what he felt about colonialism. He felt that colonialism was actually destroying these indigenous cultures and taking away all that was life-giving about that way of being. And so it's very, very strange that he, he had that insight into these other cultures, which had a kind of respect, though it was a sort of extraordinary rom romanticization, but nevertheless, it was a respect. 
and this horror of us overwhelming those cultures with our rules and our gloomy, judgmental, missionary Christianity. Nolde divided his life between the city and the country and spent the winters in the city and the summers in the country. But his attitude there to the dance was very, very different. He describes the dancers there as pale as powder and with the smell of dead bodies, impotent princes of the gutter with frantic women of the demimonde in their elegant, daring clothes. And he said, as an artist, I am also attracted by decadence, by those who exhaust their lives in the shallow pursuit of pleasure. Occasionally, I feel that spiritually, I participate in all these kinds of lives as well. So he paints the dance of the city, but it is a decadent dance. It's not the dance which is the highest form of ecstasy, which takes you straight back to nature and helps you to find yourself. It is the shallow um, pursuit of pleasure. And it is something that he tastes and, and experiences as a way of experiencing this other side of life, but it doesn't inspire him in the same way. And his wife was actually an actress. And there were times where when he was living in Berlin, he would sit in the same place as the orchestra was, and he would have all his paints there and his graphic uh, materials, and he would paint the stage and paint the singers and paint the dancers and paint the life that was going on in the theatre. And this is where you see his extraordinary ability to draw with this incredible freedom, because there's nothing about this drawing which is loose and flabby. It is really perfectly observed and, and captures something incredible. But it is this other side of life, this side of life which for him the city stands for all that is corrupting and corrupting of German culture, cosmopolitan culture, which takes us away from being rooted in one place on the earth. And these paintings are also very much part of his dance paintings, but they have a very different mood and they are saying a very different thing. In 1927, Emil Nolder and his wife moved to Ziba, the house that they built, and there he created this incredible garden where he made the flower beds in the initials of his first name and artist's first name. And the planting of the garden was the planting of the subject of many, many, many of his paintings. And there was a big, big studio and eventually a proper place to live. And although they spent winters in Berlin, they basically wanted to be there in Zibau um, as much as they possibly could. And there he began to paint these um, masterpieces, the great, great flower paintings. And it's very interesting to look at this painting because it explains something about his method of painting. It's interesting that he lived in a time where Picasso, and Gauguin, and Van Gogh, Cubism, um, writers like James Joyce and Virginia Woolf um, breaking up the, the whole way that the, the novel is written so that you see many different realities at the same time. Schoenberg, Schoenberg doing this with music and what is incredible about that time as well is that people just used many 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 different sorts of materials to make their art collage and all these things which became completely normal but Nolder never ever did anything but use canvas paint and graphic materials he never ever took up any of these modern materials and although he lived um, at some point in Hamburg and was visiting Berlin all the time, even had a house in Berlin, um, he never once painted the city, all the modern inventions of the modern world. He always stuck to this one plane of reality. The, the, the paintings aren't really about space. They're about 
form and colour and you know when something's in the front or in the back because of the tone of the paint, not because of a Renaissance rule, rule about painting space. And you can see in this extraordinary picture of the sunflower, um, what I mean by that, there is the, the thick, thick um, oil paint, very, very freely painted. Uh, the sunflower has been lifted out of ordinary reality into some mythological it's not just an ordinary sunflower, it's something extraordinary. He was aware of the work of Van Gogh, and Van Gogh was just beginning to be seen as a worthwhile person, and, and he he loved the story of Van Gogh, that he was the great, great misunderstood genius, because he felt like Van Gogh. He was a great, great misunderstood genius. And I don't know how influenced he was by that in painting sunflowers, but they're living in the country, and that's very much part of country life and absolutely intoxicatingly wonderful whether you've seen Van Gogh or not. But here you see in these great flower paintings how sticking to these traditional materials and painting on traditional materials, he absolutely hated it when the paintings were labelled and put at the right date, and he hated that in the ethnological museums as well. He didn't want things to be documented like that. He wanted them to appear spontaneously. And the other thing that he did, which made his painting so wonderfully powerful, was he always framed them with black or dark blue frames, where, whereas the norm was to use these um, gilded golden frames. And by painting extraordinary, rich, powerful, jewel-like um, paintings with their extraordinary colour and then framing them in black, they became even more radiant and powerful. And he said about colour that it has such a a power that it even has something even has something to say. And he said, the colour loves my hands. It's not always important to give you the date of the pictures, but this flower painting painted in Zebol with its stormy, stormy sky, it's actually called Clouds and Flowers, it was painted in 1933, the same year that Hitler came to power. And it has that quality of storm, which was very much part of the struggle that was going on in the art world at the time, about what kind of art would become acceptable for the National Socialist State. It is a masterpiece with that extraordinary blue and red and yellow against the stormy, stormy sky. Painted incredibly freely. And one of the things about Nolder's flower paintings is that they fall into three categories. The ones he painted in the botanical gardens, the ones he painted in Zebal, and the ones he painted in order to actually look at the shape of the flowers and sort of document them. But this is one of the three great masterpieces and that it was painted at that time in Nolder's history. I will talk about later why that was so significant. But meanwhile, just looking at the painting without any of the other things around it, it really does clutch your heart. Baudelaire said about art at that time um, that it was actually about sympathetic magic about showing you the artist and the world combined together with this beautiful sympathetic magic. And there is something about this picture which is full of magic. The apocalyptic mood of the last painting made me then choose this very, very joyful painting of the flowers in the garden, calendula, poppies, and they're tucked in between the green, the blue watering can. And here you just see the painting as sort of drifts of colour. You can you can see that there's a fence. You, you, it isn't the sort of painting that you would show somebody as a botanical study, but you, actually the flowers are recognisable. That's not really the point. The point is the sort of exuberant rejoicing in colour and the drifts of flowers in his garden. And when Nolder died, the garden was kept in the way that he had actually planted it. It was seen as part of his work, actually, and it was renowned in the 
the local people all knew Nolder's Garden and loved Nolder's Garden because of the, the flowers and the way that they were planted and the way that they were used in the paintings. So this is Nolder just exuberantly enjoying flowers and colour, the sheer pleasure of colour. Nolder not only painted the garden, but also the surrounding landscape, flat with these huge skies, the red clouds bleeding onto the earth, into the furrows, reflecting in the water. He wasn't interested at all in making any kind of social commentary. He was interested in man standing in front of the primal power of nature in all its different moods. And this is what these paintings are about. Many, many paintings of landscapes, of which this is one. It has been said of Nolder that he paints the sea in a way that no one else does. He doesn't see it from a boat or from a beach. He sees it as a being in itself, primal and powerful and godlike. And what he loves most is to paint it in its storm, stormy permutations. So what you're experiencing is not the kind of view that you normally expect of the sea as the background to a human drama, but the sea, the god of the sea, the sea which is godlike and a being in itself. I began this talk by showing you one of Nolder's religious paintings, Pentecost, but I want to go back to them now. And this is a painting which is called Paradise Lost. It's a picture of Adam and Eve sitting outside of paradise because they are naked and they are full of shame. And around the tree is twined the snake which tempted them. In the background is a lion. Perhaps that's the end of paradise where the lion was not dangerous because the lion lay down with the lamb. But here you have Adam looking full of rage and disapproval and Eve having a look of nakedness, which is beyond just that she wears no clothes. She looks almost as if she's been unpeeled and as if parts of her body have been exposed, which are even deeper than the skin nakedness that we are looking at. It's more than that. It's a profound soul nakedness. And the snake, there's almost something humorous about it because it's been painted as if it looks a bit depressed. But he's painting these religious subjects in this expressionistic style. The huge hands of Adam, the, the particular nakedness of Eve, the, the, the feeling of them just being so, so vulnerable is a very powerful image of that story. This painting is called Christ Among the Children and was painted at the same time as the Pentecost painting, which I showed you at the beginning of the talk. The thing that I find beautiful about this picture is the glance between Christ and the children. The disciples are behind him. They have been trying to protect him from the children. And he said, suffer the little children to come unto me. And the mother holding the child is looking at him. But the glance, the, the glance that is really, really important is the glance between Christ and the children. The way that they look into each other's eyes. The way they have this absolute childlike features and Christ's kind and benign face, even from that view you experience that he is young and that the expression on his face is benign. And there's something incredibly powerful in the way that he responds to them and they to him and they behold one another. This painting is called Ecstasy. And I've never understood why it's called that until I read this new book that came together with this exhibition about Nolder and his Nazi past. I discovered that at first it was called the Annunciation. And that seems to me much more 
what it should be called. There's a, a, a figure in the back holding the cross, maybe a kind of reference to what could be roses, and a woman lying, leaning back on her hands, naked, as if to receive the Holy Spirit and to, to conceive the Son of God. It's extraordinarily dangerous kind of picture, erotic, not really how we think about Mary. But um, Nolder actually said that about his Christianity, that it had to be untrammeled. He couldn't stand sort of ordinary theology or the angry Assyrian God. He had to be allowed to um, express his religious feelings in, in the way that he actually really felt them. But what is so very, very shocking about this picture, the fact that it is now called ecstasy and used to be called the Annunciation, is the reason that Nolder changed that name. We know that in 1933, Hitler came to power and it became a problem for him. He began to stop painting biblical scenes and the reason that he stopped painting biblical scenes, he said, was because he didn't want to paint um, Jews anymore. And so he changed this painting, which was called the Annunciation, into a painting called Ecstasy, in order to remove it from a biblical reference and therefore a Jewish reference. And these are the things that reading about his past um, are really deeply, deeply shocking because I think there was a part of me that was hoping that there was going to be some moment of change or or that it really wasn't so awfully terrible or true. But if you read the documentation, it is it is in fact very, very serious the way he behaved and the things that he said. His anti-Semitism was, was extreme. He actually did join the Nazi party. He did sign a special petition um, for artists wanting to support the Fuhrer. And he really wanted to be appointed as one of the, the leaders in the art world who would stand for German art and stand for supporting National Socialism. So. This painting has a, a kind of shocking history. Not only is it in terms of modernism and painting absolutely revolutionary in the way that it pa paints Mary, it's also um, an image which tells us about the history and the struggles of our time. This next group of paintings are Nolder's paintings about polarities. If you look at this painting very carefully, that you'll see that behind this sweet, rosy-cheeked girl with her soft, rosy breasts and her flowing hair, there is a dark figure. This is the this rosy girl, and behind her is Satan, whose hand is actually holding her hair on the left-hand side of the picture. And this is one of the things that Nolder painted a lot. He painted a lot of polarities where two beings of, of completely opposite quality and character and mood are placed together in the same image, but they are not doing anything. They are simply placed there. And it is this, this play between the opposites that he is interested in. It's a kind of thinking which is very important. Goethe talks about it. He says, it is said the truth lies halfway between two opposing opinions. Not at all. It is the problem that lies between and that which cannot be envisaged, namely eternally active life contemplated calmly. So what Nolder is doing here is he's not saying here is a goody and a baddie. He's not saying either or. He's saying these two elements stand side by side in the painting. They stand side by side in life. They stand side by side in us.
This painting is called The Ruler, and one side of the painting has the image of the sort of dancing girls who are there to give this man pleasure. Next to him are his guards, and he is sitting looking out into the distance with a kind of terrible ennui. And I think the image is about the corruption of power. And what it makes me think of is this beautiful story of T. H. White's when he he makes one of the um, he makes Merlin teach the young Arthur to learn about all the different aspects of human nature. And he he does this by transforming him into different creatures. And one of the creatures he transforms him into is a fish. And he goes into a great moat around a castle. And there he sees the pike, the pike which has total and complete power. There is nothing. He is the most powerful creature in the moat. Everyone is afraid of him. Everything moves out of the way when he comes. And there's something about power, absolute power, and having nobody to brook you or to make you accountable, which doesn't leave you feeling um, wonderful and exhilarated. It leaves you feeling lost and broken and empty. And this is the mood that I find in this picture. This painting is called Child and Large Bird. And these paintings are often described as a mixture of grotesque and fantastical. And what is interesting about them is that Nolder talks about them just appearing, that they, are, they insist on coming through when he's painting. He's not, he doesn't plan them at all. And what is interesting about this picture is the way that he, he changes the relationships of size. The child has got a massively large head and seems to be standing peacefully and helplessly. And this creature, this bird, which is more grotesque, is nevertheless fleeing from her. So their relationship is ambiguous. And the only person I know who paints like this is an English painter called Ken Kiff. And he spent years in Jungian therapy. And when I look at these pictures, I really feel as if you can almost see the proof of Jung's ideas by looking at these pictures. But I will talk about that a little bit more when I talk about the next picture. This painting is called Maturity of Life, and it depicts an older man and woman bound, bound together in absolute mutual respect and harmony. And behind them is this beautiful, beautiful blue light and they themselves are painted with golden browns. Everything in this painting is about respect and mutual love and devotion. I'm now going to talk with you about a group of paintings called the Unpainted Pictures. And these paintings are all on a on pieces of paper about the size of a postcard. They're all um, watercolours and the legend that surrounded them was that after Nolder was put into the exhibition of degenerate artists by the Nazis, he was forbidden to paint and that he lived in Siebel and had a secret room which looked out onto the plain and the path leading up to the house so that he could see anybody coming in case somebody was coming to um, take away his, his work or to take him away because he was not allowed to paint. And he painted in watercolour so that they couldn't um, smell the oil paint and he was able to hide it as soon as he saw anybody walking up the road. This was the story of the unpainted pictures. And this new research that has been done by this group of people around the exhibition in Berlin in 2019 tells the real story of the unpainted pictures and I will try and tell you that 
um, a little bit before we look at the pictures and then while we're looking at the pictures I will um, uh, you know fill in more details. We are looking at a painting of a seascape painted on a piece of paper the size of a postcard. The watercolour is underpainted with tempera and that's why it has this incredible depth and power. And we are looking at a picture which is called an unpainted picture, which is called something that doesn't exist. And the combination between it existing and having the name of something that doesn't exist sets up a kind of dynamic which in the soul, which makes one feel that there's something very poetic about that name and this group of pictures. And I myself always loved the legend of the unpainted pictures. I think because I felt that if Nolder had been not allowed to paint because of being put into the Degenerate Art Exhibition, that must mean that by the time he was painting these paintings in Zibau, in the time of the war, he would have actually renounced his Nazi past. And this is what made me love these pictures so much, that they were the pictures of, a, of somebody who was suffering and unseen and had no doubt through suffering and being unseen renounced all that was going on in that terrible time. This unfortunately was not the case. This is another unpainted picture and it's called The Adorned Couple. You see again these polarities, an older man with a younger woman, a dark haired man with a blonde haired woman, He's got a flower in his hair, which makes one feel that there's some kind of festival. Despite their age difference, you don't feel as if it's a power relationship. You feel as if there's something beautiful and wholesome and healthy about it. And there's the use of graphics um, to bring out the drawing, which is not always what happens in Rilke's paintings, but what he does when it's watercolour, because he can't create the form in the same way as he can with oil paint. Another positioning of two different beings, an animal-like being who is almost, we know from Nolder's own, own writing that he often used animals to describe the male lust of the, of the female form, but the female figure, though naked and um, being embraced by this um, male animal creature, is nevertheless not a sympathetic being. You don't feel as if she's a helpless being being overwhelmed with power by power. You feel as if they are both enjoying this lustful union. And it's these polarities that um, Nolder is playing with even now at this time when he's painting these paintings during the time of the war. Once again, we have a male and a female figure. The man is dressed and looks more sombre. The girl is red haired and half naked and she's smiling and there's something about her which is wanton. One has the experience perhaps of a seductress. All these things are just conjecture. The paintings need to be lived with and experienced in order to find some kind of mood or meaning, but it's not something one can pin down. This painting is called Friend. It has a very loving, benign mood. The faces of the two figures, children, holding onto each other lovingly, are shining because they've been underpainted with tempera, which means that the watercolour um, is, is making it possible for there to be light shining through the watercolour. Beautiful, joyful, loving picture of a a gesture towards two young children loving and protecting each other. This is a painting of flowers, lilies and irises especially. There's something more to this picture than just a, a still life of some flowers that, that Nolder liked. They have the quality of being held, held aloft in some kind of ceremony or to be cast upon the ground in honour of something. The flowers are lifted up out of ordinary sort of bourgeois household decoration into something more mythical. 
and more powerful. This little watercolour is called Gort the Red. After the exhibition of degenerate art, Nolde began to paint um, imagery out of Norse mythology and Icelandic mythology because he was trying to curry favour with the, the Nazi party because that kind of mythology was much more attractive and more likely to be accepted by the people who were going to judge whether he was allowed to paint or not. And he painted a whole series of works which were in watercolour at this time using this mythology. And then later, after the war, when he used the watercolours to paint oil paintings, he didn't paint very many of the ones which had a Norse mythology uh, root because at that time, after the war, the Norse mythology had fallen into disrepute because of its being used by the Nazis. And so very few of those paintings actually became oil paintings, whereas a lot of these unpainted pictures that were painted at the time of the war were then used later to, to, to work up to large oil paintings. This is one of the unpainted pictures which was worked up into an oil after the war. It's called The Great Gardener, and it's a picture of Nolde's theology that behind all creation is this ultimate being, this mighty, ultimate, meaningful being, and that all of the earth and all of us are somehow or another connected with something which is not material and which is not explainable, but which um, lies at the basis of all things. In order to bring this talk to a close, I'd like to just explain the real story behind the unpainted pictures and also the real story between what we knew about Emil Nolder and his life and what we now know since all this research has been done. When I practiced this talk with a friend, she said after I'd given it that she felt as if something very traumatic had happened in hearing this story. And I was so grateful to hear her say that because that was exactly how I felt. I had always talked about Nolda with a kind of song in my heart. And this time, having read all the things that I read, I found myself actually experiencing trauma, as if I had found out something terrible about someone I really loved. The reason I had had such a positive experience of Nolda was that many of the notes and, and documents which showed what had really happened had been quite consciously kept secret by Nolda. So after the war, he was taken away to be denazified, like so many people were, and he came back and he began his art life again, and he began writing a story about what had happened to him during those years of the war, and that's when the story of the unpainted pictures came about. But what had actually happened was very different. After he had been put into the exhibition of degenerate artists, he was actually the artist who had the most paintings in the exhibition of degenerate artists. He went and he begged to be taken out of the exhibition. He said that he was an absolutely loyal German. He was a, a loyal um, supporter of Nazi ideology and that it was completely wrong that he was in this exhibition. And actually, the, he was only in the first exhibition in Munich. And when it traveled all over the country, his work had been taken out. And at the same time, he had had to put in a, a series of pictures to a, an organization which checked whether you could paint or not. Um, in a, if, you were, if you were a painter who the Nazis could support painting, and you had to put in a set of pictures to be judged. And while he was waiting to find out whether he was going to be allowed to paint from that set of pictures for that very brief time, he was not allowed to paint. But as soon as the work was passed, he was told that he could 
carry on painting, but that he was not allowed on any account to have an exhibition or do anything publicly with his work without first checking that it was okay with the Nazi authorities. And so actually he was not forbidden to paint through the whole time of the war. And when the war ended, he made up this story of the forbidden pictures because this story made him seem like a kind of hero of the war who was carrying on with truth and beauty while the Nazis over overwhelmed the world. But actually, that wasn't true at all. He did continue to paint in this little room. He did have this little room upstairs where he painted. And he did paint lots and lots of small paintings called the unpainted pictures. But there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these small paintings, and he had painted them all his life. The thing that we have to understand about Nolde is that he was always making pictures of himself, romantic pictures of himself. He he had a story of how he wanted to be seen and perceived, and he made sure by the way that, that information was released that that story was kept safe. And one of the things that he wanted people to believe was that he was a person who was very much living in Zibal, close to the land, and before that he was always close to the land. And all his different journeys all over the world and all his visits to cities and the fact that he was so actually in touch and involved with many, many of the most exciting contemporary painters of the time, the whole of the Blue Rider. Uh, Paul Clay, Clay particularly liked him. I believe that he learned how to print from them. And he was involved with the with De Booker, which was incredibly radical. I think it was quite consciously um, communist. Um, he knew, you know, he knew the work of Turner. He had visited England. He was actually much more of a of a cosmopolitan traveling person. But he didn't want anybody to think of him like that. He wanted them to think of him as the misunderstood, brooding truth-telling great master living alone in the country and making this work for which there were no little sketches before because he didn't need little sketches before they literally were born out of his soul fully made like Pallas Athene springing from her father you know he, she was born out of her I can't remember which part of his body she was born out of but she sprung fully formed and armed out of her father's was it his mouth? I can't remember. But anyway, that's how he wanted people to think of himself and his pictures. So when he created this myth of the unpainted pictures, he probably put a lot of pictures into that group called the unpainted pictures painted between this period of the war that had been painted maybe in 1910, maybe in 1914, you know, or earlier, earlier, long before. Um, the mature Nolder that we we see now in these pictures. So um, the thing that we really have to understand about him is that he has a story about himself and he has created that story. And he not only created it by the way that he presented himself as a painter, that he didn't need to do these sketches, that it came out of him fully formed, but also he, when the war was over, he went back over notes and things that he'd written and he removed things from the notes that he knew would be unpopular. As, as I told you earlier, he stopped painting Norse paintings um, because that was no longer um, the thing he needed to do in order to curry favour with the Nazis. And he was actually... In, also, the other thing about Nolder, which we don't really realise, is that he was incredibly successful. He, it, One of the reasons that the Nazis were so against him when he brought his paintings to be looked at for them to decide whether he could paint or not was that he was making so much money. And so, um, you know, this idea of uh, Nolder being sort of financially secure and having heaps of people loving his work and buying it and getting it all back out of the degenerate um, art exhibition, getting back the pictures that they'd taken from his house and taken from the people who bought them. I mean, all these paintings were returned to him because he was so clearly a loyal Nazi. They didn't, um, I mean, it, it is actually known very, very clearly that Hitler absolutely hated Nolder's paintings. And the wonderful um, psychotherapist Alice Miller, who wrote The Drama of the Gifted Child, she says about, 
she's written a, a whole load of essays about artists and the effect that they have uh, the effect they've had on famous people and and she said that one of the reasons that Hitler absolutely could not bear any of the expressionists was that they really make you connect deeply with your middle with your feelings with your authentic soul and he was so determined to to teach the the german i mean he actually gave speeches where he said he wanted german youth to be known for their heartlessness and their ruthlessness and and we know that Huss, who became the commandant of of um, Auschwitz, that he was working in the camp outside Munich, um, and he was in the SS, and he deeply, deeply wanted to be a farmer, but instead he was he was working in this camp because he joined the army and joined the SS, and he found it absolutely unbearable how cruel they had to be. But he says in his biography or autobiography that he writes just before he's hanged after his trial, um, he says, I, it was not possible for me to say to my fellow soldiers, I cannot do this, it, and it, it's too painful, and it's too cruel, and to actually admit to being vulnerable was the worst thing that you could possibly do to be a good Nazi in the SS. And of course, the thing about uh, Nolder's pictures, I mean, I know that for myself, you know, Kandinsky talks about the soul, being like the, um, the, the strings and a piano and that the colours are like the hammers that beat the, the soul and make this incredible music of colour. And I have experienced it myself that I have walked into galleries where these paintings are and without any understandable reason have found myself weeping because they so connect you to the whole realm of the feeling and the soul. And so, I mean... You know, Nolder had many, many um, uh, high-ranking Nazis who valued and appreciated his work, but Hitler absolutely hated it. And if you read the book, you can read the things that he said about it. I don't particularly want to <laughs> quote it here, going out online like this, but do read the book if you'd like to find out in more detail. So after the war, Nolder created this myth of himself and the unpainted pictures and he kept all the notes and documentations of everything that had ever happened, his um, support of the Nazis, the letters, the, the frightening and terrible things that he'd written um, in letters to Ada or um, friends. These were all kept in the, in the um, Stiftung, I think it's called. Um, and... The person looking after it, one of his closest friends, was was sworn to to do as Rilke asked, that the that the information would not just be seeped out, and that this particular story would be the story that was carried. And it's true that people knew. I mean, the local people had seen the swastika flying above Rilke, um, Nolder's house. There were people who knew about his support of the Nazis. But everybody was so absolutely traumatised by the war that there was a sense in which, you know, this is the story of one of the greatest German artists in the world. Can we not mess it up with the terrible, terrible story of his support of, of Hitler? I think people just could not bear one more ghastly thing. And the story came out very slowly. Um, there were two events which um, made it come out. One was the the trial of Eichmann and the sort of realization in the world of the true reality of the Holocaust, and then also the trial of the the guards of um, Auschwitz, and these two events made it so that some of the information uh, uh, was leaked a bit. So when I used to give talks about Nolder there was always this sense that there had been something, but you couldn't quite pin it down and find out exactly what it was, as you can now. You can actually read everything. And now it's all come out completely openly. We now, we know, we now know everything that has been said and which had been hidden. And I think it's something absolutely amazing about our time that we can really look at it and look at it truthfully. And, and what it makes me feel is that there is this... 
amazing thing that happens in literature. I just looked it up to see when it was written. And in 1910, E.M. Forster wrote Howard's End. And I remember as a little girl reading Howard's End and being involved in a world where there was a social culture. We all knew how to behave and what was expected of us. I was a middle class girl and I was supposed to go to a school and go to university and marry somebody decent and have a house in Tuscany and have you know, nice healthy children. And my husband was supposed to be somebody rather marvellous and who my mother could feel proud of. And this was the story. And then I knew all the time that I was living in this very, very conventional middle class culture that there was an enormous amount going on which was so complicated and so painful and so full of drama and and suffering and it was something that one simply never ever talked about but I did find it talked about in literature and in Howard's End which I don't know if any of you read but if I'm sure many of you have but if you haven't you're so lucky because you've got it still to read it's wonderful but the the leading character, a woman, Margaret Schlegel, has to say to her husband, she asks her husband to do something which is um, socially uh, dangerous and unacceptable, and he refuses to do it in, in the name of his dead wife. And she, she says to him, thank you so much for bringing up your dead wife. I will speak of her. And, and she describes to him how he has had an affair and done so uh, for pleasure and then cast this woman off and not thought anything of her and now he's uh, she's asking for some help for her sister who has not had a, a feckless and selfish affair but a really loving affair and now she's bearing the consequences of this affair she might actually have a she's having a baby and in those days that meant you might die and she says to him you know you have been so spoilt we have all allowed you to have these illusions about yourself and she makes this amazing statement to him she says you know what you have done I have forgiven and your wife has forgiven what what my sister has done can you not forgive and she says to him you have to connect you have to experience that what you say you are and what you are is congruent that it's not this secret world behind a social face and I remember reading that as a little girl and just thinking oh my god oh my god oh my god I'm not alone I'm going to go out into the world and I'm going to find those people who want to be like that, who want to be what they wish to seem. And it's been my experience um, all through my life that this has got more and more and more possible. I remember recently just hearing Ted Hughes talk about, you know, finally publishing the birthday letters about Sylvia Plath and Sylvia Plath had committed suicide and about this he was absolutely silent, he was judged, he was assumed to be the cause of it all. And just before the birthday letters um, came out and there were these, he was sort of, uh, he got these incredible prizes and adulation for this extraordinary and wonderful description of this complex relationship, which was nothing like the sort of public picture. And he said to his daughter, I've discovered that talking about your personal life, which was something that I thought one should never do was actually the right thing to do and if I had done it earlier there would have been so much less pain and so when I look at this this story of Nolder that you know he it has literally broken my heart to discover all these things about him but I want to be able to say I want to know the people around me in their weaknesses and their strengths I want them to be able to know me in my weaknesses and my strengths I want to be able to say what I have done, you have done, what you have done, I have done, that we we talk to each other about our weaknesses and learn from them rather than reject each other if we are not perfect. And of course, being um, deeply involved in something which brought about the Holocaust is is not something you can speak lightly of. It's not like being horrible to a couple of friends for a few months or something like this. This is so traumatic, what happened in the time of the Nazis. The suffering of, of what happened at the time of the Nazis, the suffering of what happened not only to the Jews, but to so many, many millions of people. I, I think somebody once said that 45 million people died as a result of this war. And the stories are so complex, the children that were stolen away and 
um, from Poland and oh I mean you just can't believe the things that happened and so of course you can't speak about this lightly but um, I want to be able to look the truth in the face to say somebody who made such a terrible terrible mistake in what they supported and what they believed in also made paintings of such unbelievable future looking openness that that broke open whole new vistas in what was possible in visual art and paintings which actually possess extraordinary wisdom and strangely enough i was just reading a book um, while i was preparing this talk it's called on connection and it's by a an english poet called Kay tempest and there she talks about um jung and his red book and how he talks about the two different parts of ourselves and he says that we have this part of ourselves called the spirit of the times where you are preoccupied with your culture and with fitting in with your culture and being successful and finding the approval of your peers and then there's this other side of you which is called the spirit of the depths it's the ancient part of you the part that responds to the spiritual world uh, uh, the spirit that see the, the the spirit of the depths that sees the soul as a living existing being and and i when i read this i thought this is what is so strange about finding out about nolder because i think that he was a person who was often painting out of the spirits of of the of his depths he was actually in touch with this complete and absolute wellspring of imagination and magic which is so essential in everybody's life if they are to feel joyful and um Jung actually says that you need to balance both you can't just have one or the other and do them both in extremes you need to balance them but I think one of the reasons that we sometimes see the, this work and it's so exquisitely wise and beautiful I mean to talk the way he did about the sea I am not seeing it from a boat or a beach I am seeing it as a being in its own right a god I mean what a way to paint the sea what a way to talk about it I mean it gives me goose flesh and there's something about him which is so profoundly wise and yet at the same time he did say and do some things which make my hair literally stand on end and which I will suggest you to read rather than me read them out but he was most definitely anti-semitic and and he also even in in the middle of the war in about 43 he wrote that he he felt that Christianity had been completely misunderstood and that the whole the whole thing about compassion and love had actually weakened our culture and that what um, Hitler was doing was giving it back its power and its strength and of course if you read these terrible speeches that Hitler made to the young where he said I want you to be known as the most heartless ruthless race upon the earth this is what it means to be strong you can see that he was even corrupted by this which you can't believe if you are sitting looking at this picture here that I am talking in front of but I just want to say one other thing and that is that um, when I read in the book about what um, German scholars thought about Nolder you know at the time he was actually in the chancery uh, uh, Merkel had him in her office and you know people asking questions can you really have this man uh, represented there I think they're changing the pictures all the time he's not the only one there and um, this man says you know you cannot create a world where there is only this hero this perfect hero and everybody who falls out of the perfect hero role is not allowed to speak is not allowed to do anything and if we start sort of taking these pictures out of circulation because of of the the weaknesses of Nolder the terrible weaknesses of Nolder we will actually be behaving like the Nazis who decide what we can and can't write and read and look at and be and that it is about living with this complexity and asking oneself the question who am I 
what would I have done at that time? What am I doing now? Which could be the seeds of that time. I never forget reading um, Albert Speer's wonderful biography where he describes meeting Hitler. He was a man who'd never been loved properly and he didn't really want to meet Hitler. He was rather snobbish about him and he met him and Hitler did this thing where he looked at him and he saw him and he beheld him and for the first time he felt like he was someone and he got um, drawn into that mad, mad, mad world. And I remember thinking at the time of reading that, I am so grateful that when I was a young girl, the man I met was a loving, compassionate man. And my mentor, who made me feel seen, was a good man. But what if he hadn't been? Maybe I too would have been beguiled. So for me, the question of this story is... How did it happen? How do we understand it culturally? He was a conservative. He came from this peasant culture, which was renownedly conservative. They were the, the German people were so traumatized by the First World War. They were terribly, terribly frightened. And this man came with these um, uh, uh, supposedly charismatic and amazing pictures, which made people feel seen and heard and understood. Where has that happened recently that we know of, actually? <laughs> Uh, a lot of people say that about America, and and we are left with this question: what what can I learn from this story? What can I learn from living with this complicated question of paradox, of the good and the bad being present in one person, of genius and absolute shocking wickedness being present in the same person? And how can we look at this story and say, how can I learn better how to be human? So I'm ending the talk with this exquisite unpainted picture of this Piero and Lilies. We know that Piero, the clown, can be Christ. When you see the lilies in religious pictures, they are often messages from the spirit the Annunciation, she carries lilies. And there is this relationship between the lilies and the Piero. He could be a Christ figure, he could just be, he could be anything, but you sit and look at this picture, which is so delicate and tender and loving. And what I would like to remind you of are the wonderful words of Goethe. It is said that truth lies halfway between two opposing opinions. Not at all. It is the problem that lies between, and that which cannot be envisaged, namely, eternally active life, contemplated calmly. And for me, what this means is, we cannot say either or, good or bad, there's good people, there's bad people. We can only say, how can I have the resilience and bravery to look in the face both the good and the, the lost and corrupt, the difficult parts and the wonderful parts, and to own them all? And I just keep remembering the beloved Thornton Wilder. It's terribly sad that he's not published at the moment except for one or two um, of the more famous things, but his wonderful, wonderful novels. And he says that you cannot make good art unless you include in it the dark. You cannot make anything, relationships or community or anything at all without including both the light and the dark. And if you push away the dark, what you are reduced to is sentimentality. And sentimentality has no strength to face the challenges and the wonderful joys of life. <laughs>